Hi there, folks, and welcome back. It's James Marley here, and you're listening to The Rules of Investing. The Rules of Investing gets inside the minds of leading investors, economists, and industry experts, and is brought to you by Livewire Markets. Last episode, we got into the high-octane world of growth investing with Jason Orthman from Hyperion Asset Management. Today, we're getting a peek inside one of Australia's most reliable and consistent dividend-paying stocks. In fact, the company has met or increased its dividend for 23 consecutive years. But don't be fooled with the risk-averse approach of this company, which has been able to generate market-beating returns over one year, five years, 10 years, 15 years and 20 year timeframes, all while navigating a range of economic conditions. Now, if you haven't figured it out yet, I'm talking about Washington H. Sol Pattinson, the $12 billion diversified investment house listed on the ASX, and sometimes referred to as Australia's answer to Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway. My guest is Brendan O'Day, who has held the Chief Investment Officer role at Salt Pats since the tie-up with Milton Corporation, where he was the CEO and CIO at the time of the merger. In this episode, we'll be digging into the equities portfolio of Salt Pats to find out where they are finding opportunities. We'll also get a temperature check on some of the other asset classes that Salt Pats has within its sites. If you're an Apple podcast or Spotify user, don't forget to subscribe to the podcast so that you don't miss an episode. Or if you're a Livewire subscriber, hit the follow button at the bottom of the wire to be notified when new episodes are available. If you're not a Livewire subscriber yet, just head on over to livewiremarkets.com. It's free, easy to register, and you'll get access to insights from the leading investment minds in the country. With that done, let's get on with the show. And Brendan, uh, welcome to the Rules of Investing. Good morning. Thanks for having me. You joined Soul Pats via the merger with Milton a few years ago, where you were CEO and CIO, as I said. Can you tell me a bit about your professional background and, importantly, your approach to investing? Yeah, absolutely. I, uh, I guess I've always been a keen investor ever since I was uh, at university. I, I interned with Morgan Stanley and, and Barclays at the time, which was kind of an unusual thing, actually. Most of my mates weren't interning at investment banks and maybe popular popular around the bar at, uh, at drinks time. But um, I've always been a keen investor and, 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 and you know, it's, it's sustained, you know, throughout my career. You know, when I left uni, I moved to KPMG. I did a stint with a you know, an accounting firm. Uh, I enjoyed that. I'm a qualified chartered accountant, but it didn't really stick. Um, my love was always uh, at investing, so I moved over to uh, what was then County NatWest Securities uh, for those who have been around the market for a while, um, which you know ended up being part of Citigroup over the years. And uh, I stayed with Citigroup for 23 years. I had a great ride there. I was uh, here in Sydney, Hong Kong for a few years where my two younger kids were born. Uh, New York for a few years, um, where I got to see the beginning of the GFC, which was interesting, uh, and then Tokyo for six years. Uh, so I was there for the earthquake. So, you know, events seemed to follow me around. Um, but I, st- I was with City for 23 years, had an excellent time there, met some uh, met some great people and I learned a lot uh, in terms of, you know, risk management and, and trading and investing. Um, you know, left City in around 2018 to, to Milton Corporation and replaced over time the great Frank Gooch, who was there for about 20 years or so. Uh, and it was there for about three years um, until the time of the uh, the merger with Soul Pats. So it's uh, it was a good ride. Um, I've been an equity investor my entire career. Um, you know, I'm, I've been around the markets, various markets all around the globe, um, learned a few lessons along the way, which has really guided my thinking around investing. And, um, you know, I've, uh, as I said, worked with some wonderful people over that time. So that's kind of my professional background. I'm a risk manager and, and trader, I guess, by background. Um, I'm a little on the quantitative end of the spectrum. That's how I think about life. But um, when you invest for a living, you uh, you get very familiar with the vagaries of the market. You know, in terms of investing philosophy, you know, I, I think in all that time, I've settled on the idea that long-term investing is probably the way to go about generating better returns over the long term. Markets are very volatile. Um, they do tend to recover, but they're very volatile. Information comes and goes, gets consumed and and uh, disseminated very, very quickly these days. And, and so generating returns and holding through cycles um, seems to be a sustainable way of, of investing and is very much how we go about it. You know, I'm big on the idea that um, you need to be disciplined about the way you go about investing. Not every investment is going to work. You really need to be focused on your portfolio, do the work. And, and if something's not working, you need to move on. So I've learned a lot of lessons over the years. I've worked with some wonderful people. Uh, and Soul's Pass, Soul Pass is a great organisation, which is very well with my investing philosophy and uh, has been very successful over a long term. So it's, uh, it's a great place to work. I work with a bunch of very talented people and uh, you know we, uh, we perform well, which is great as well. And, and how has that transition been from Milton, which was a traditional 
um, old school LIC, predominantly large cap equities, I believe, to, to Sol Pats. Is there been a, have you had to make changes to the philosophy and, and the way you think about investing? It was an easy merger, firstly. I mean, we share a lot of DNA. We shared a chairman, as you probably know, Rob Milner was the chairman of of Milton and of Solpats, so um, that made it a lot easier. But it was more than that. I think we, we shared a very similar way of investing. You know, we were fundamental investors. We're value-oriented. Um, we were also long-term investors at Milton and at Solpats. Uh, so, you know, the, the merger was very easy from a, from a DNA and investing philosophy point of view. All of the staff came across. Um, it's, been, it's been very, very straightforward. It was a large merger. I think people underestimate how big um, each organisation was. And, and the combined organisation now is about $12 billion. So we're a big, we're a big outfit um, and a big, uh, a big market capitalisation. So um, but the merger was, was, was pretty straightforward and you know, very well received, I think, by both groups of shareholders has been successful. I think that many of the uh, assertions that we made around portfolio diversification um, and the opportunity for each group of investors to, to have a, a, a better outcome has really come to, come to fruition. So I think those investors have stayed. We've got 60,000 investors now, many of them Milton investors, but many of them Souls investors as well, um, have had a really good experience with that. At least that's the feedback we get. And it, it, it was a good process. In terms of changes, I think because the DNA was so similar, we didn't make, need to make a lot of investment changes. Souls has always been a very good risk manager, and you can see that in the performance numbers, right? So there wasn't a lot of change needed to the to the talent and the and the process. But what we've been very focused on is, you know, we're a larger organisation now. We're much more active, which you're probably seeing in our in our public uh, announcements. So you know, we're layering a lot more process around internally, operationally, uh, just so that we make sure that we're resilient. You know, in a, in a way that we that supports the activities that we are undertaking right now so that we've, you know, we've instituted an investment committee. Um, we have a lot more focus on our credit portfolios. We've added a lot of headcount into the organisation. We've roughly doubled in size um, over the course of the last 18 months or so. Uh, so there have been changes. There have been a lot of changes, but not really anything at the core of what we do. Mm-hmm. You know, the core of what we do is still long-term investing, focus on the shareholder, generation of dividends, sensible risk management and sensible investment decisions, and that hasn't changed. But what has changed is the size of the organisation, which is uh, which is materially different. And, and the asset class mix seems to be broadening as well. Yeah, I think that was one of the primary strategic benefits of doing the merger. You know, Solpats at the time was a little liquidity constrained, and, you know, the Milton portfolio, which was essentially $4 billion worth of listed equities is, is acts as a real uh, liquidity source uh, at the heart of our business. Now, that's allowed us to get a lot more active across all of our portfolios, um, that portfolio as well, but our small cap portfolio, but certainly in terms of private assets. I think there was, you know, we had a real opportunity to, to grow that part of our business. Souls has had a lot of success over the years uh, in terms of private assets. If you look at our strategic portfolio, um, many of those assets grew out of, you know, private investments, um, New Hope, was in that camp, TPG was in that camp. So I think there's a real desire on our part to, to seed the strategic assets of the future and a lot of that's going to come out of our private portfolio. So, And that we, takes time. And that takes time. You know, I think we, we're not a classic private equity investor. We don't, we're not a fund manager, so we don't have a fund. We don't have a, a time window that we're operating with and we're very happy to partner with businesses and take our time about things. But it does take time. And, and it takes sustained investment and working with management teams. And we have our own way of going about it. But we, you know, we see a lot of deal flow that, you know, candidly, other people don't see. And I think we operate in a way that, you know, really resonates with some, um, you know, some, some business owners over the years. But it, it's, you know, it's been a real area of focus for us, um, that diversification. But it's not really diversification for diversification's sake. Each of our investments needs to stand on its own feet. And we're not operating to maximise the number of investments. We're very, you know, we're much more focused on having well thought out individual investments um, and we're doing that across the portfolio. Yeah, well, let's stay with the, the listed and the liquid part of the portfolio at the moment. In 2023, Salt Pats amassed a pretty sizable war chest, $900 million. Some of that was funded from a, a sell down in the large cap equity portfolio. Is that a, a reflection of your views on the opportunity set in large cap equities on the ASX? Yes and no, actually. It's probably the right answer to that question. I think, you know, if I rewind back to the start of 2023, we had pretty much a consensus view that rates were going higher, which they did. We had a consensus view, really, that we were either in a recession or going into a recession and that earnings would probably sort of follow from that. So I think that, you know, we were cautious on the market back then, certainly in terms of the public markets. 
So we thought it was quite logical for us to, to get a little more defensive on that portfolio, raise some cash and, and wait for better opportunities. Uh, as it transpired, the market was very strong last year, as I'm sure you and your listeners know, So, um, which is interesting. And we still managed to outperform, which is encouraging. Um, it speaks a lot to our portfolio construction that we were able to do that whilst carrying a lot more cash. Uh, but we were cautious last year in the, in the face of you know, that rate environment. It wasn't just that, though, really. I think that the desire to invest more in private assets, uh, the opportunity that was existing in private assets on a sort of risk-adjusted return basis was quite compelling to us and still is. Um, we were of an opinion that we could build credit investments that, for example, were going to get equity-like returns much you know, higher up the capital stack in terms of in terms of protection. So we just saw opportunities really to to move out of listed equities into other asset classes that were going to generate really compelling returns for us, risk adjusted and headline, as a matter of fact, and also at the same time express a view around the listed markets that uh, that made sense to us. Yeah. And so, what does the the equity portfolio look like today in terms of the size and spread across the market cap spectrum? Are you, have you got a, a bigger portion in small caps? Are you? What does the balance look like? And a bit of that question goes back to allocation, which we'll probably end up talking more about as we go along. But we don't allocate in the classic sense. Um, we don't sit and look at our portfolio and decide that we want X in large caps and X in small caps and X in, in private equity. It's much more bottom up than that. Um, so we will look for the opportunity. We will, you know, we're very well connected and we see opportunities, but the, the, the portfolio comes together as a series of, of individual investments and ideas. So the sort of classic portfolio construction, if you like, is not, it, it doesn't operate quite that way at, at our place. We have three, to answer your question sort of you know, more precisely, we have three por- portfolios. We have a strategic portfolio, a large cap portfolio and a, and a, and a small cap portfolio, which call, we call emerging, which I'll explain in a minute. Um, so we do actually have investments really up and down the market capitalisation spectrum. We do skew large cap, our strategic portfolio, which is where we have New Hope, TPG Brickworks, and some other smaller things as well, is larger cap skewed um, and long-term held, and as, as you probably know, very, very successful, yeah. uh, and it's performed, continued to perform well. You know, you have three very well diversified assets there that operate in different parts of the economy, um, don't correlate really with each other much at all, with very good long-term histories and great management teams. So that's performed very well and has been the, the core of Sol's cash generation and performance for a long, long time. Uh, the large cap portfolio is the old Milton portfolio, if you like. It's about $2.5 billion at the moment, so it's a lot smaller. Um, we've, we've raised some cash and we've redeployed some cash. That portfolio is a lot more concentrated. Now, um, it does go up and down the capitalisation spectrum, but I wouldn't say it goes down to smalls, so but it has a lot of mid-cap in that portfolio. Mm. Um, it's about 35 names right now, so it's a lot more concentrated than it used to be, um, and it's a lot higher velocity in terms of turnover. So that portfolio may have turned over... 10% a year at Milton, it's, it's multiples of that now. Um, so that portfolio is quite different and performing better you know, in that construct, which is not surprising to us. We're always of the opinion that that LIC construct, um, whilst is a, you know, it's been performed very well over a long period of time, is a little constraining in terms of portfolio optimization and management. But that portfolio goes up and down the market capitalization spectrum. And, and our small cap portfolio, which we call emerging, Uh, is about $900 billion right now. Um, It goes up and down based on opportunities that we see at the time. We may get into it later, but it's sort of skewed heavily towards resources right now. And we call that emerging um, because actually quite a few of those companies aren't necessarily small caps anymore. You know, they're actually larger than some of the mid caps and large caps that, that, that people identify that way in this market. So we call it emerging. And hopefully they emerge quickly and we, you know, they're profitable investments. So we do go up and down the capitalization stack. Um, We're very happy moving between that, but we don't classically portfolio construct, and I think that's the probably the more important point. We often hear small cap managers talk about um, capacity constraints because of the, the index and and the weightings and liquidity and, and those sorts of things. That emerging portfolio sounds like it might not it might have capacity to grow, given that not all of the stocks in there fit the classic small cap description. Is that is that a fair comment? I think it's a fair comment. Uh, I think it's also think it's a fair comment that you know a lot of small cap managers are capacity constrained. I mean, you know, we're a large organisation now. You know, we're a twelve billion dollar uh, manager of assets. Um, so, you know, we need to pick and choose where we go with that. Um, it makes little sense for us to have too many small investments. They take just the, just the same amount of work to manage, but don't really move the dial for us. So, um, I think that's a fair comment. If you looked at the construction of that portfolio, you would see that actually there's not a huge number of names in there in terms of the really big material investments that are in there. They tend to be sort of very specific around a theme or an opportunity. So our portfolio is very, very different, but it's um, 
it's a tricky part of the market from a liquidity point of view. And liquidity, you know, really matters, I think, to most investors. The good news about sole paths right now is liquidity is, is something that we're, you know, we're, we're quite long of. And liquidity is a wonderful thing. Liquidity is, 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 it costs you a little performance when the market's going higher. But when you need it, you can't, necess- you can't have enough of it. So it's, you know, we, we're a firm believer in holding liquidity. Um, but, you know, at the small cap end of the spectrum, it can be a little constraining, I would agree. Well, let's, let's dig into that a bit, a bit further because Sol Pats and, and, and your colleague Todd Barlow and, and Robert Milner talked about having a, a cautious stance as we moved into to 2024 and, and listeners could go and find articles in the AFR, some, some comments on Livewire as well around that cautious stance. Are you feeling any pressure to get that cash invested back into the market given you know, we've seen a, a bit of a rally and, and a rip higher in the past few months? We certainly have seen a rally and a rip higher. I think everybody was a little surprised with the uh, velocity of that rally into Christmas. It's obviously a, it's traditionally a seasonally strong part of the market, but um, it, was very, it was very, very strong both here in the US. I think the good news for us is we don't tend to feel pressure to do many things. You know, I think that, again, as a, you know, we, we invest shareholders' capital. Um, we're, not a, uh, we're not a fund manager in the classic sense, so we don't tend to get pressure to put money to work. Um, we're very happy to wait for, I think, what Warren Buffett would describe as fat pitches. Mm-hmm. I think you know, when you see the macro come together with the valuation uh, and an industry and a sector and a stock that you like, um, it's better to wait for the, you know, for the good pitch and hint that and then be brave on that. So we're quite happy to wait. Uh, in terms of uh, deployment. We have deployed some of that cash um, over the course of the last six months uh, into parts of the portfolio, probably primarily our private assets. Um, We've continued to be a little cautious around our listed assets, but no pressure per se. We do see opportunities. We see a lot of opportunities across our portfolio, be it credit, be it private, uh, be it you know, the emerging part of the portfolio as well. But but no, we don't we don't have the cash burning a hole in our pocket just yet. Um, I think that liquidity is a wonderful thing, and and you know if the market were to pull back, uh, we could react and may well do so in the listed part of the portfolio. Um, if we give up a little performance because the market rips higher, as as, as you mentioned, that's okay. We probably sleep a little better at night, and we know that you know. When the market pulls back, which it inevitably will do, we can uh, we can reposition then. So yes, we've used some of the cash. Are we in a hurry? Not necessarily. Mm-hmm. In the most recent AGM presentation, Todd Barlow talked about a, a one-team culture that you're developing, and, and with particular reference to uh, you know members of the investment team across credit, large cap, small cap, and this idea that you know investments need to compete and, and money goes to the best ideas. Can you tell me a bit more about how that works and also a bit about how you work alongside Todd and division of duties, et cetera? Mm. Well, I mean, first and foremost, it works well, clearly, because the performance has been great. Um, but I think that one team culture is, is very important to us because it goes to the heart of that capital mobility point that, uh, that you just made. You know, none of our portfolio managers necessarily own the capital that they have invested. Uh, we don't allocate, as I mentioned earlier, classically. So if we want to move money out of the large cap portfolio and into into private credit, then we're free to do so. And the large cap portfolio guys don't get too upset about that. And if the money were to flow the other way, um, it should work that way as well, um, out of the private credit portfolios back. And, and I think that leaves us in a very unique position. Most asset managers don't operate that way. It means that we can go to where we think the best risk adjusted return is at any given point in time. We're a, relative, we're a relatively small team, so I think we're, it's, it's easy for us, you know, even though we're 50 people now, um, it's easy for us and for everybody in our team to know what we're doing and why we're doing it and how we're doing it. And I think it's easy for us um, in that process to allow for challenge. So I think it's, it's critical because we're really a team of generalists. You know, if we need specialist skills, we can go out and get them and recruit them uh, or borrow them candidly. But we're a team of generalists, and, 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 and I think the ability to operate across all asset classes uh, all market capitalization spectrums uh, and all parts of the market to find the best ideas and allow the best ideas to find their way into our portfolio um, is pretty unique. And I think it's really you know, a big driver uh, of our returns. I think you know, I've, I've been asked to describe our superpowers and I think you know, this is probably at or near the top. Mm-hmm. Now, our capital is permanent, which is great. Uh, we can do this without fear of our capital walking out the door. Um, we can operate long term. We don't have um, investors hanging over our shoulder worried about the last six months numbers. Uh, and we can do all of these things uh, in a way a lot of asset managers can't. And in terms of how Todd and I work together, we're quite different animals, actually. Um, Todd is a lawyer and private equity expert by background. Uh, I'm a public markets risk manager 
you know, investor type person by background. And, you know, so we are quite different and we often come at, you know, this, at problems or opportunities from quite different perspectives. But, you know, we tend to end up uh, at a place of uh, a place of consensus or not, not always. Uh, but I think our, our, our decision making process is better for it. And I think, you know, encouraging that conversation internally and and allowing the best idea um, to rise to the surface is something that we're passionate about and and something that actually you know day to day in our organization works so it's a it's a it's a different place to work um, it's a it's got a an atmosphere that has come down from you know a, a founding family and a history and a legacy and I think that you know, people are comfortable in the organization we perform well uh, we communicate well um, and um, you know day-to-day people tend to have fun so it's it, it works very very well um, and it's uh, it's pretty unique well let's bring it to life a little bit which asset classes or opportunities uh, are making the most compelling case for capital inside Sol Pats right now yeah I mean you can look at where we've been going lately um, in terms of direct portfolio allocation, and it's been private assets, generally. Uh, so we've used our listed portfolios, our, our, our listed portfolios are, as a source of funding for private assets over the course of the last 18 months. That may not always be the case, but certainly has been the case for, uh, for, the, recent, for the recent time. Credit is probably where we've been focused most, although we have been investing in private equity as well, um, but I can break those up separately as we go. You know, private credit is a space that got quite dislocated during COVID. Uh, you've had the large banks come out of that space, uh, there's a lot of activity and need for, for for funding, as you as you know, and there's a real opportunity. You know, there are transactions being done in that space that were, you know, seven, eight, nine, ten percent returning transactions, you know, three or four years ago that are now in the mid teens. So you're getting, as I said earlier, equity like returns with a very very different risk profile. We've been heavily investing both in you know portfolio and capability in that space. So we've been you know adding people and we've been adding size to our portfolio and and we'll continue to do so. So there's real opportunity we think in that space. We think that persists because the banks really aren't there. You know generally that asset class can be a bit mean reverting, but we think actually that stays a little you know wider for a while. A bit more of a structural yeah change. probably I think so. But you know obviously should that change over time we can we can reassess. Uh, we've also been adding to our private equity portfolio. Um, we do a, a relatively large-ish uh, addition to that portfolio in, uh, in, a, in a fruit packing facility um, down in Shepparton um, around our ag portfolio just uh, after the last balance date. So that was, that was interesting. So we will continue in our private equity portfolio to, to look for ways to bolt on um, to the thematics that we're, that we're around in that space. So I would say private assets is where our focus has been. Having said that, our public portfolios have been performing great. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and, and if we found an opportunity to, to add to any of those portfolios, um, and it made sense to us at the time we could do that as well. So, you know, I think what it illustrates really is our ability to move capital in a way that most other asset managers can, really can't do. Could, could I get you to bring it to life a little more and, and be a bit more specific with a few of the examples where, where you've been putting money to work? You mentioned fruit packing, but also in, in the credit space, the particular parts of the market that are, are more interesting, or is it case by case? Well, it certainly is case by case, but I can expand a little on that on the, on the ag side of things. So we have about half a billion dollars in our ag portfolio. We have roughly 12 farms in there. We're in, you know, fruit and uh, and sort of uh, that part of the market, so not no cotton and no cattle and that type of stuff. So we, it's a, it's been a growing part of our portfolio and something that we think that Australia is actually good at. You know, I think there's a there's not a long list of things that we're wonderful at in this country, but, you know, you know agriculture is one of them, and, and we've been growing that part of the portfolio for a while. Um, we obviously grow fruit and pick fruit. Um, we haven't traditionally packed fruit and there was an opportunity to, you know, to acquire an asset down at Shepparton, a fully automated fruit packing facility for just around about $200 million, um, for, you know, just after the, uh, the last balance date, uh, which we did. And that's a, that's a classical, classic vertical integration play for us, uh, gives that asset more weight for us, allows us to bolt on something that makes sense and um, it's pretty easy to understand. So it, it's a good example of us taking... Uh, an existing position, an existing investment, and adding to it in a way that makes sense. Mm-hmm. In terms of the credit portfolio, we don't tend to sort of get into individual names, but you know that portfolio is very diverse. You know we have investments in financial services in that portfolio. We have investments uh, in property in that portfolio. We have, although it's not really property skewed, there's quite a lot of resource exposure in, in that portfolio as well. It's got an average duration, so you know in terms of our repayment profile of about two and a half years. Uh, it has a running yield and a you know, expected return in the mid teens, and uh, you know it's a it's a very different uh, it's a very different sort of activity. You know you you really need to be active in that space. We see a lot of deal flow. We're quite well known in that part of the market now in the Australian context. Looking to grow that offshore as well um, in terms of 
working with managers offshore to find opportunities as well. But our focus really is largely Australian. But it's uh, it's it's a fascinating part of the portfolio and one that we've um, we've been working very hard on. Off the back of the interest rate hiking cycle, there's been a a, a view that there might be a, a bit of a a default cycle that follows on as as businesses find it a bit tougher to do you know um, you know to operate in that that higher rate environment. Are you finding that you have to to knock away a lot of opportunities? Like, are you seeing any evidence of that that credit cycle? Not really. I think you know I think Aussie businesses and it probably applies globally have been really quite able to pass through inflation and pricing and, 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 and rate increases to, to end users. And you've seen that in corporate profitability. It's been quite strong. Um, this earnings earning season that we're in right now has been, you know, pretty benign, candidly. I know CBA reported this morning and their numbers were, were pretty benign. In fact, I think their provisions came in better than expected. Yeah, so I, I think the same with, with, with ANZ and now yeah. the provisions were, were, were very low. Yeah, so I think, you know, the, the economy's not in bad shape. I think, you know, we were thinking recession last year. I don't think that's on the table right now. You know, rates are higher, clearly, but I think we're probably, you know, at all where we need to be there. Maybe US rates come lower and ours, you know, flatline for the year. I don't really know. I'm not a rate strategist, but, but you know, I don't, th- I think we've probably seen the worst of the rate cycle. So, I th- uh, you know, I, you know, we do, do we, I mean, we do turn away a lot of business, but I think that's our usual diligence process. and no more and, than and Exactly, but no more than normal. And, and in terms of the investments we're in, uh, we haven't seen a lot of stress. So it's, um, and that really is consistent with what we're seeing in external markets as well. So... No, not really, is the answer to the question, and let's hope it stays that way. Okay. I just want to dig into a, a few of the themes or the buckets that the firm is, you know, stated are areas of opportunity. For those listening, these are in some of the Solpats presentations you can find online, but the four buckets I'm going to talk about are en- the energy transition, wealth management, agriculture, which you've spoken about, and education. Given Solpats has got such a, a strong legacy in energy with, with New Hope, I'd be really keen to understand how you're thinking about investing in the energy transition and, and some of the opportunities you're finding there. Yeah, I mean, I think we're all aware of the fact that the world's on a journey towards electrification, frankly. I think we're, we're talking electric cars and electric houses and electric industry, and, uh, and I think that's that shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody. And I think along with that goes the need for higher, more power generation, and I think Clearly, the complication around that is the world wants to decarbonise at the same time. So there really is this push-pull between, you know, higher electricity needs and, and a desire to generate electricity in a cleaner fashion. And I don't think that thematic is new, and I don't. I think everybody's acutely aware of that. Um, you know, we've been a large investor in New Hope for a long, long time. You know, as we look at that energy transition, we think that coal still has a role to play for probably the foreseeable future uh, in terms of the need to generate power. Uh, New Hope sells primarily into Asia. Um, so I think that, you know, Asia will be a little slower in terms of moving away from coal-fired power generation than perhaps Australia will be. But there is a transition and we're, you know, we're obviously very alert to that. Um, we think New Hope as an investment uh, sustains through that um, and, you know, in 10 or 15 years' time, I think we'll have a different view of the world in terms of coal and its role that it's playing at that point in time. But New Hope's a, a wonderful investment for us, um, has been a, a real generator of cash for us over a long period of time. It's very responsibly run, it's very responsibly managed, um, it's very responsibly rehabilitated. So it's an investment we're very comfortable with. And we think it holds up in an energy transition world. Um, that said, there are other opportunities around the edge of the transition. I think the challenge is finding opportunities that really generate the returns that we want them to generate. You know, if we look at the returns that are coming out of renewables right now, they're not really that compelling to us. I think really that's an opportunity for people with a lower cost of capital than perhaps us. Um, But if you look in our portfolio, you you see investments like Amp Control, which is in our private equity portfolio. It's an investment that we took 100% ownership of in the last 12 months or so. It's an electrical engineering operation up in Newcastle um, and has serviced for a long time the mining industry, but has a real opportunity to expand into this kind of transition space by you know, remote mine side electrification or grid stabilisation or any one of a number of applications um, around that business uh, in, a, in a sort of transition sense. So there's a real opportunity in that part of the business. And that's a nice example of how we will yeah, go after that. So we're quite we're, we're quite alert to that. In our emerging companies portfolio, we've got an increasingly large uranium exposure. Yeah, that's around that same thematic. Obviously, we think nuclear is going to be part of the solution over the long term. Perhaps not in Australia, but certainly globally. We've always been an investor in that space, albeit small, um, but we've grown that recently. So we're, we're quite alert to the energy transition, and I think our our investment in New Hope allows us to be quite close to that. 
and um, hopefully we can we can go about building portfolios or individual investments that that make sense in that context. But I think it's uh, it's definitely one of the dominant themes, and it will be around for decades. And um, you know, we're we're very keen to be a part of it in a way that um, fits our portfolio and allows us to make money. Is uranium has been incredibly topical? Um, people have been following the uranium. Uh, and the nuclear story f- for many years. I, 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 it's been a bit of a widowmaker trade for a lot of people, and and the true believers have had their um, their hands tested. But it's obviously having it, its time in the sun at the moment. What's the? Could you take me inside the thesis that Solpats has developed around uranium and and how big of an opportunity you think that is? Yeah, I think um, the thesis is very straightforward. It seems like you know the best thesis theses. If that's a word that we uh, that we have over the years are actually the straightforward ones. Uh, we see a supply shortage in the uranium market. We've been watching that for a while, and and the team who are around that portfolio have been tracking that. And you know, it got to a point where we we thought it was it was getting interesting with the price where it was and and the targets where we thought it could go to. Uh, and obviously, nuclear could well be part of the solution to to decarbonisation. So I think it it was it was getting to a point where it was becoming interesting. Um, we had some small investments in our portfolio. You know, Boston, you know, and and companies like that that people would know and love. Uh, but we did have an opportunity uh, presented to us, uh, which goes to our sort of proprietary deal flow, frankly, that we see uh, to invest in NextGen, uh, which is a Canadian startup producer, which should have the lowest cost deposit you know, globally once it's once it stood up in Canada. It's in, Sask- in Saskatchewan. And uh, we've invested in that through convertible bonds and straight equity, a couple of tranches of straight equity. It's a it's a three or four hundred million dollar investment for us now, so it's quite material, and it's been very very successful as you as you highlighted. You know, uranium's having its time in the sun. I think it's it will be a volatile commodity over time, and you know, supply will come and supply will go. Uh, but we think structurally, there's a story there. We feel a bit the same way around, you know, battery metals and 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 the like. So, you know, we, you know, in our listed portfolios, we've got exposure in there. We've got a decent sized BHP exposure in there because we feel, you know, strongly about copper and its role. Um, we're building some exposures around the lithium names because we feel like that's got to a place now where it actually makes a bit of sense to us price wise. Uh, so we're very we're very aware of the space and and we look to make you know investments as and when they make sense. But uranium has been a, a new one for us um, and very successful so far. So um, we will see. Um, but you know we. We look to make our investments in unique ways. Mm. And so, way- so long-term believers in the lithium story? Yeah, long-term believers in the battery story. You know, I think it, it's, it, asset prices are, you know, around commodities are notoriously volatile. Um, and you know, things will go, uh, as you said, that things will have their time in the sun. So we're quite happy. It goes back to our, our sort of discipline point. You know, we're quite happy not to be in the lithium names when they were ripping last year as they were and wait for a better time. And uh, you know, we're, happy, we're happy to give up performance along the way. But, uh, but, yeah, we're a long-term believer there. Well, Brendan, that brings us to the, the end of the, the main part of the interview. But uh, followers of the rules of investing will know we have three questions, uh, regular questions that we put to our guests in each episode. So we might get into those. And, and, and the first question is, could you share a story from a, a big win or a big loss? What happened and what did you learn? I knew you were going to ask me this one, right? So the big win, big loss question is always an interesting one to me because and maybe it's because I've been investing for a long long time but it seems to me that you know win and loss stories are always a bit tricky because we've all had wins and we've all had losses and it's often the case that you can do all the homework in the world you can have a great investment thesis you can be in the right part of the market you can be at the right stage of the cycle and you can do all of those things um, and sometimes your investments just don't just don't work out conversely you can just be at the right place in the right time and have a great win so I, I think the right way I think about that is more about, you know, answering the question around discipline. You know, I think that the key really in terms of how I think about portfolio construction and how we think about it at Souls is making sure that you put yourself in a situation where you, you, your probability is in the right place. So if you've got investments that aren't performing, you don't really need to own them. And if you've got investments that are performing, you should be quite happy to run them. And, and I think you don't really want to spend too much time over bad investments. And I think if you operate your portfolio that way, you're going to find that you get lucky more often because your investments are going to compound. And that's really where you get those big, those big kicks. You know, if you've got a part of your portfolio that's compounding, which is what TPG and New Hope and Brickworks have done for Souls over many, many years, that are compounding consistently and you're not really backing away from those investments and you're holding them for a long period of time, that's where the big returns come from. The small wins and the small losses on a, on a short-term basis don't really move the needle. Um, it's the long-term things. It's the discipline and the, and the focus. 
But to answer your question, I'd like to give you a, a recent example, one of the, the big wins we've had recently, which speaks a bit to this, actually, is 2S. So 2S, um, for those who don't know the stock, is a, is a Singaporean you know, telco startup which, spun, which was spun out of TPG, run by David Teo and his management team. Um, shares that we basically got for yeah, 50 cents or almost free um, as part of that spin-out. Um, and, you know, the stock has been expensive the whole way along, along classical measures, but, you know, you've got a great management team there. You've got an obvious opportunity in a market that, you know, has, is ripe for disruption. You've got a large population there that is quite savvy. You've got a lot of things working for that investment for you, but it was quite pricey, and it was a, you know, it was a very small cap at the time. And that investment for us is up 500% over the course of the last few years, um, including, you know, 50 or 60% this last year alone. So I think that speaks to our philosophy, you know, which is... If your investments make sense, you can hold them for a long time. You will find opportunities to make money out of them, you know, as you go along. Back management teams, back relatively obvious trades, pay attention to valuation, but really pay attention to valuation on the way in. I think, you know, if you've got investments performing, I think we're quite happy to run, you know, up, you know, a long way up into the into the multiple spectrum. Um, but that's one of the best examples that we've had in the last twelve months of a of a real win for us. But I think the key, really, at the end of the day, is discipline. Um, that's what puts you in a posi- position where you can actually have more wins and less losses. It's interesting that when you think about those strategic assets in Sol Pats, it's, you know, a, a constraint you don't have is that um, they can become a big part of your portfolio. And I know a lot of mandates constrain um, maximum position sizes, which kind of goes against that idea of letting winning positions become big within your portfolio. Exactly, and that's a constraint we simply don't have. And it's really been, you know, a, a big contributor to our performance. Allowing those things to compound, allowing them to get big, is something that we can do that not everybody else can do, and and um, has really been, you know, a big source of success for us. What do you think investors are, are overlooking or have wrong about markets right now? What we're most focused on, really, at the uh, at the top level, is valuation. I, and I don't think investors necessarily have that wrong. I think as we sit here right now. Again, no recessions, rates are probably peaked, um, company profitability is pretty robust, this earnings season is looking pretty good. It all seems okay from a, you know, from, a, from a macro point of view, not that we're macro investors, but it all seems okay from a macro point of view. Valuations, though, to us seem quite elevated and quite elevated in the context of a, of a higher rate environment and quite elevated in the context of a rate environment that is you know, very sensitive. So I think if we have a situation probably in the U.S., where rates don't get cut on the path that the market expects. You can have a lot of volatility in the market and we'll probably find better opportunities to buy back in and valuations are elevated. So we're quite constructive on the market right now. We're probably biased towards lightening up on those you know, really pricey parts of the market right now. There are parts of the market that we think are quite investable as well. So I think that it's about stock selection. It's about feeling comfortable about your investments. It's, it's about, you know, going to sleep at night, not worrying about something that's in your portfolio. But what do I think people are missing about the market right now? I think it, I think it sets up pretty benignly, but I think really the key is valuation. It seems a bit rich to us right now. And, you know, I think the, the critical thing is to us, you know, if we were to buy a, 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 add a new investment into our portfolio, particularly in the listed space, you know, are we going to get the return that we want to get over the next three to five years? The value, if it's a valuation we're paying for that investment right now, appropriate to generate the return that we think we're going to get or are we paying a, a lofty valuation that may unwind. Um, so I think there are times of the cycle where valuation becomes relevant. I think we're at one of those times now. But, you know, I think that's one of, one of those inputs that is always part of the investment decision. Um, but, you know, I think it feels a little stretched to us and we're probably of a mind to keep reducing portfolio search right now. Final question. Solpats is all about long time horizons and being patient. What's an asset or an investment where you believe investor patients will be rewarded over the long term? It's a tricky one because we view almost all of our assets through the long term lens. You know, I think, you know, when you when you when you take generation of dividends as seriously as we do and shareholder return as seriously as we do and alignment with shareholder interests as seriously as we do, you have to have a sort of sustainability lens in terms of how you approach all of your investing, you need to feel pretty confident that anything that we're putting in the portfolio for the long term is going to operate and sustain us through the long term. So there, there are, I think there are opportunities, really, long-term opportunities across 
all parts of our portfolio right now. Um, you know, we've talked about the investments that we made in the private space, and they're all long term opportunities. Really, I think the credit opportunity is a long term opportunity, notwithstanding that the individual parts of that portfolio may come and go. Um, and private equity, for, with you know it, it, the assets that we have in that portfolio, we feel very strongly about over the long term. So it's probably in that private space where we would stay focused right now, and it's probably in the private equity space. But you know, I think the key is for us, we're essentially a portfolio of risky assets. We need to make sure, and we, we're pretty confident around our process of generating re- yeah, return and performance out of that portfolio over the long term. Souls has performed better than the market for a long, long time, and we've done so because we've got a process that makes sense to us and works. And you know, we intend to keep continuing that. But I, but I think that's about generating, you know interesting ideas, great returns uh, across the breadth of our portfolio. So I wouldn't want to single anything out in particular. Um, I think that you'll probably see us continuing to invest in those private assets for now, probably private equity, to generate that kind of long-term new strategic investment for us, the the, the new big compounder that we want in our portfolio. But we're a large organisation right now, so I think you know we're, we're always looking for you know, strategic opportunities and larger investments, so I think you'll probably see us do more of that as well. But it takes more to move the needle these days. It does take more to move the needle. We're a twelve billion dollar organization now, and you know if you want to keep outperforming by three percent, it becomes quite a large number. So I think yeah, you'll see us do more of that. You know, so we're thinking quite strategically. We always do, but we have the capacity to do that now in a way that you know perhaps we didn't in the past. We're a lot larger. We're a listed company, so we have shares that we can use as currency. Um, we have a set of opportunities that, frankly, a regular asset manager doesn't have. So you'll see us, you know acting long-term and thinking long-term across the breadth of our portfolio and probably thinking and acting a little more strategically as well. So it's, it's, you know, we have a lot on our plate. We have a lot of opportunities, but you can rest assured that just about every single one of them will be long-term in nature. Well, Brendan, I've really enjoyed our chat. It's been great to meet you and I've really enjoyed the the deep dive that you've taken us through the the way that the Soul Pats portfolio is put together. I hope, listeners, I hope you've enjoyed that discussion as well. And, And Brendan, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Well, folks, that's the end of that episode. I hope you enjoyed the discussion with Brendan and gained some useful insights from the Soul Pat's way to invest in. Coming up on the next episode, I'll be speaking with one of Australia's leading economists, Dr. Shane Oliver. Shane has just celebrated 40 years as the Chief Economist at AMP and has dedicated those years to educating Australians about the state of the economy. It's going to be a great episode, so please remember to subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss an episode.